Good evening and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. It is a pleasure to extend welcome uh, to our distinguished speaker, Professor Dr. Stephen Grima. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Grima, for accepting the invitation and being here today. Of course, today we have like a well-known scientist in the field of theoretical chemistry. His academic journey has been marked by exceptional achievements and contribution to the scientific community. Professor Grima started his academic journey by studying chemistry at the University of Braunschweig. After that, he earned his PhD in 1999 at the same institution. And in 1997, he obtained his uh, habilitation from the University of Bonn. Uh, he has been a university lecturer at the University of Bonn and then a professor at the University of Munster. And since 2011, he is a distinguished university professor at the University of Bonn. Of course, during his professional uh, journey, Professor Garima has occupied several esteemed roles showing his expertise in the field of quantum chemical methods. Uh, in recognition to his, or of his outstanding contribution, he received several prestigious awards. Of course, I couldn't uh, like say all, but for example, Leibniz Prize. Also, he became Max Planck Fellow. Regarding his scientific research, of course, he's focusing on a lot of things, but for example, development of efficient and robust electronic structure methods, balancing, balancing the cost and the efficiency in quantum chemistry, and some like recent, pre, uh, uh, recent breakthroughs include this extended tight binding and London dispersion collections, which I think famous for all. And uh, Professor uh, Karima is recognized like a highly, uh, highly cited researcher. So today we are honored to have Professor Karima present his insight on low cost electronic structure methods for large molecules. So please join me in extending a warm welcome to Professor Grima. So the floor is yours. Yeah, please. Yeah, many thanks for the invitation. I hope you can hear me. Sorry for the technical problems. Uh, yeah. yeah, anyway, yeah. Um, today I will talk about what just have, has been mentioned. So efficient quantum chemistry. Next slide, please. So this is uh, the outline. So. First, some, some introduction and motivation for those of you who are not so familiar with the topic. And we'll say something about general DFT and some thermochemistry benchmarking. And then I will present two very recent, very new ideas for making these uh, low-cost methods more, even more efficient and, and maybe even better. Uh, the, the fourth point, it's really at my heart. So I'm working day and night on a, on a third generation tight binding model, uh, which sh should be hopefully uh, applicable to, to, to general chemistry and, and extend our recent work. So next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so what we are doing today uh, very often is kind of multi-level quantum chemistry modeling. So uh, as you can see on the top of the, the picture, we, are, we have very often a huge number of candidate molecules for material science or for catalysts or in pharmaceutical chemistry, which with some desire, which should have some some properties. So we're looking at at specific specific purpose molecules, and from this huge chemical space, we have to find the right ones that that fulfill our 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 target properties. And in the very end, we we know how to do these computations at high level, so wave function theory or DFT with a large basis set. But um, so we can afford these few calculations, maybe a, a few hundred or so, or tens. But in the very beginning of these multi-leveling procedures, we have to compute very many structures, thousands, ten thousands, even maybe millions. And for that purpose, we need these efficient low-cost DFT or tight binding methods. That can be... Um, basically anything. So I will focus mainly on, on, on uh, more organic molecular uh, problems, systems, but the same is for material science for, for solids in, in principle, at least. So the same uh, 
um, strategy, strategies and procedures are used. So at the end of the day, we want to filter out the relevant interaction motives, or in particular for, for pharmaceutical chemistry, the, the, the conformational problem is really an issue. So finding the, the, the lowest energy conformers for a given molecule. Next slide, please. So we have developed over the years uh, procedures how to, to do this in practice. So here you see at the right, in the right part, at the very end, we want to compute something. So it could be free energy or also spectroscopy for compound identification. Uh, we did a lot of NMR or circular dichroism. In fact, so NMR was the original uh, idea of the whole thing to automatically compute NMR spectra. So, and we start the whole uh, process by generating a lot of structures. We have a, written a code for that, which is called CREST and which is pretty, pretty uh, popular. Um, it, it can do conformational screening, searching, but also a bit more. So, and when we generate thousands of structures with that code, normally at force field or tight binding level, and then we apply filtering steps, first at low level DFT, and we have developed uh, methods for that called 3C methods. So this is normal DFT modified in a way so that um, make them efficient for um, geometry optimization and energies. And of course, then at the, the so highest level for only a few structures, we then perform the best that we can do or the best that we can afford. I have no time to talk about CREST in detail, but give we want to give you only um, some, some brief look at it. Next slide, please. So CREST can search for confirmations for you. It's done by metadynamics in a particular uh, setting so that it is robust in general. So there's no need for definition of any coordinates. You just take the your input structure with Cartesian coordinates, give it to Crest, and then it will search for conformers, for aggregates, non-covalently interacting ones. You can also look for protomers and tautomers. And all this is done at the quantum chemistry level, at normally at tight binding, but in principle you can, could could run this at any quantum chemistry level. Normally this is take takes them too long, so the the efficient quantum chemistry is an essential point here. We also added um, a feature to compute the molecular entropy by by sampling over the conformational degrees of freedom. So this is Crest that is very often used. It's as all our software, you can download it freely from GitHub. It's also further developed by a student of mine. So this is kind of, has become in the last two, three years, so kind of state of the art way of, of doing confirmations. Next slide, please. So Crest runs on an on the fly computed potential energy surface for your system. And now the question is, what level should it have? What what can we afford? And this diagram shows you some rough estimates, uh, timing estimates, relative computation time, and an estimation for um, for the accuracy that you can achieve. And it's on the the timing axis. It's, it's a logarithmic scale. So we are talking here about orders of magnitude difference from the right, where we have the highest level that is the current gold standard in quantum chemistry, which is coupled cluster at the basis set limit. And on the very left, where you have, say, force fields that we are, also have developed. And then anything you can think of electronic structure theory in between. So um, we are working mostly right now in the middle part in what is uh, indicated here in green, the so-called 3C method that are used normally after the tight binding or the force field. And our workhorse in practical application is indicated here given in blue, which is our GFN2 XDB tight binding level, which is fast, it's robust, it's reasonably accurate, but not good enough 
for many things. It's good for geometries, as the name says, G stands for geometries. You can compute vibrational frequencies relatively accurate. This is where the F stands for, and also non-covalent interactions. This is the N. But the accuracy is limit for very limited for various reasons. And we want to improve upon that. So we want to more closely approach the DFT level and also extend it in purpose so that it basically can compute anything for you what DFT can. So you want to get closer to generally to DFT level. And this is what I'm, I'm right now working on. The, the working title of that method is GP3 XTB. It stands for general purpose third model. And in the end of the talk, I will give you some details about it. Okay, so next slide, please. A few words on these three C methods. Um, so we started in 2013 with that idea. On the left, you see a diagram where we have indicated the, the level of that um, composite methods. So we started actually with Hartree-Fock at a minimal basis set level that was <clears throat> HF3C and then in continuously increased the basis set, but still compromising on the on the um, computational demands so that it is still uh, efficient to run very many uh, calculations. So you have to account. So what we, were, what we are basically doing is compromising in the base set. So we're making the basis sets small to get efficiency, but of, of course we have to correct for the for the errors that you introduce. In particular, the basis set superposition errors, BSSE, you have to correct for. And we have developed over the years various means and ideas to do so, and also improved um, these um, methods, also regarding the, the better physics. So the, the, the latest methods, R2 scan 3C and Omega B97 X3C, are the best that we can that we have now. They are physically best, least empirical, and you can out of the box basically apply them to anything uh, what what DFT can you can do. I will give you an idea what Omega B ninety seven X three C can be used for. It's a uh, the, the 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 main improvement here is in the basis set and also in the underlying functional, which is now a range separated hybrid. The next slide, please. And I want to show you now what can be done with this and also um, how, how we uh, test if this is the approximations hold, if they are good enough for the typical applications. So I will now spend some time on, on, on general DFT and, and um, energy benchmarking. Next slide, please. So you know all the, maybe the, hopefully the, um, the Jacobs ladder John Perdue introduced, where we can classify density, fun density functions according to the in ingredients and that what problems they can solve. So in, in, um, in chemistry, I'm mainly using uh, hybrids or, or GGAs or even double hybrids, which then include uh, uh, non-local information um, about uh, the electronic structure. And at the hybrid or double hybrid level, when you include dispersion corrections, you can solve many chemical problems. And they are also normally um, accurate enough for thermochemistry. So in particular, the self-interaction error is problematic with GGAs and meta-GGAs. And this can be can be um, this problem can be solved with the RSH that we normally apply. Next slide, please. So this is a theoretical scheme. Now that you can, you, you have to test them if they are really good, if they hold what, what is promised. It's interesting that you, what you can find in the literature, there are by some of colleagues initiated popularity polls where you can vote for your favorite functionals. And I'm really pleased to see that some of my functionals are also popular. So here indicated by as um, in this box here, but I mean popularity is not a good scientific way to 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 measure <clears throat> robustness and accuracy. 
So we are doing norm normally thermochemistry benchmarking. Next slide, please. And we continued development that started actually with um, uh, John Popel uh, and also Don Trula worked a lot and Pavel Hopsa and Jan Martin and others um, in establishing, developing standardized benchmark sets. So sets of molecules with accurate high accuracy reference data on which you can test basically any um, electronic structure method. Maybe even force fields can be tested on that set. set. And we have develop, developed a super database which combines many existing sets from the literature. And uh, yeah, this is continuously extended and developed in the, in the uh, field. And we have this so-called GMTKN55, which tests general main group thermochemistry and kinetics and consists of 55 subsets covering a um, large part of chemistry that is relevant. Non-covalent interactions, atomization energies, so reaction energies and isomerization and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. And from this huge number of data points, in particular, um, um, yeah, you have to make, yeah, the important here is to, to get statistics right. So you have, um, 1,500 data points, energy data points for over 2,500 reactions. And then we finally condense a single number out of this um, big table that indicates um, accuracy. This is a number that is basically a weighted average over all the benchmark sets. This is a, an energy number in kcal per mole and then you can classify and order your methods, DFT, whatever, according to accuracy. And this is shown here in this picture. For a bunch of dispersion corrected density functionals, ordered according to Jacob's ladder. So double hybrids on the left, hybrids in the middle, meta GGAs, GGAs, and also you see some composite methods in green on the very right. And the smaller the value, the better the method it is. Next slide, please. So this is a, a zoomed in. So I just included here only in green uh, hybrids and, and range separated hybrids. And, and then in more detail, some um, of our composite methods. And as you can see the Omega B97X3C, so one of our latest uh, uh, composite methods that <clears throat> applies a double zeta, especially developed double zeta basis set, is almost on par with the parent methods. It's only slightly worse. So it's almost as good as a standard range separated hybrid, with, but with a much larger basis set. So you, the savings here is in the basis set. So these three C methods are normally 10 to 100 times faster than the, the parent methods, but keeping more or less, depending on the level, the, the accuracy. So this is what we were aiming at. So keeping more or less the accuracy of the parent functional, but at a speed up that depends on the method. What I indicate, what I show you also here in, um, in red is the performance of the actual uh, GFN2 XDB, which is one of the best or the best tight binding methods. Method. And as you can see, this, this uh, weighted total mean absolution uh, deviation goes through the, through the roof. So this is much, much worse than any of the existing density functions with a weighted total uh, MAD of almost 30. Why is it so? Yeah, the, the GFN2 was never constructed, never meant to, to um, be applied to hardcore uh, thermochemistry problem. It can optimize well geometries, give good frequencies, and non-covalent reactions are bad. But in this GMTKN55 database, there's also a lot of thermochemistry, which is currently not possible. So what is the final aim or really our target and what is what I'm right now working on is to make this tight binding semi-empirical methods as good as bad DFT, so to say. My dream or my target is something around here, 10K. So that would be 
extremely nice to have. And you should keep in mind, this is very important, that this tight binding is even 10 to 100 times faster than the composite three C methods. So roughly speaking, such a tight binding calculation is about 10,000 times faster than a uh, range separated hybrid in a, in a big base set. So that you really can screen uh, huge ensembles. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, this is a showcase for this new Omega B97X3C that can be used, that is ready, that is done, has been developed. So we also extend these databases, this benchmarking sets. Here, this is a set brand new um, for non-covalent interactions in large structures. So not these tiny molecules and tiny complexes with just a few tenths or dozens of atoms, but here we have up to 2000 atoms in, in these model complexes. And what you see here in gray is always a kind of host and in blue, uh, the guests. So it's a host gas uh, non-covalent interactions. So this covers um, a broad range of non-covalent interactions. And in red one, in red, you see the, the reference interaction energies that are difficult to get otherwise than with this uh, accurate DFT reference method. And now you can test uh, and benchmark on this set any low level method, including, including force fields. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, we are working also on conformational benchmark sets. Conformations are very important in medicinal and pharmaceutical chemistry. This is an a benchmark set that you will see later, MPConf196, is an ensemble of polypeptides, linear ones and, and ring structures that has been developed by Jan Retzak and co-workers. And we recently also improved on the reference values. I mean, such a benchmark makes no sense if the reference is also not good, okay? So it has to be at the highest level that we can afford and we are running here local couple cluster calculations for that. This is done by my coworker Andreas Hans. This set is also used um, or extended in a, in a sense of solvation problems. Solvation is always an issue. So we took these structures and added explicit water molecules and then generated also conformation energies for these solvated structures. It's also important to get to get this effect right. So this is just an example to show you what we are working on. Next slide, please. Yeah, there is one very, very difficult subset in this GMTKN55, which is different than many other benchmarks where you, you often you consider chemistry that we know. So the conventional reactions, conventional compounds. But this is not what we are aiming at. So in principle, we would like to get any structure, also unusual ones. I mean, we are looking normally in the progress of materials or molecule development for new things, right? So this is science. So we want to test in a way how robust methods are on structures that are normally not contained in any of the of the standard sets and not and cannot of course be made in the lab so some some decade ago or so we developed a procedure uh, to generate so-called mindless molecules so basically you take from the periodic table some elements randomly put them in the the, the atoms in the coordinates onto the corners of a cube or in a sphere and thus just randomly and then optimize this molecule. And if it fulfills some conditions, <clears throat> which you have to apply because of the reference, then you get out in, in the end a molecule that is reasonable from an electronic structure point, but has unusual interactions. And then we take this molecule and decompose it, normally in, in uh, closed shell, uh, molecules, and then we have uh, get a reaction energy, which is normally pretty bad, uh, pretty big, because these um, uh, artificial molecules, mindless molecules, are very energetically high lying. And then we compute a um, 
a reaction energy at the reference level, normally coupled cluster. And then any method, electronic structure method should, should get this right. You here see here in the bottom some examples uh, of artificial molecules that uh, are generated in this way. And in this, over this 55 subsets in GMTK N55, this is one of the most difficult uh, tests that you can run. Next slide, please. So now the question, how does semi empirical how do, are they performing for, for this mindless set or, or the other GMTK ends? You have seen already that, um, that they do not perform so well. And this is a general observation that has been made frequently also in the literature, that all the semi-empirical quantum mechanical methods are persistently inaccurate for, for, for important chemistry. And this is what we want to uh, repair. Next slide, please. I will show you now the example of this mindless molecule benchmark set. So this, as I said, this is high energy chemistry. So the average reaction energy is around a few hundred or so in this set. And if you're running DFT on that, you see you have errors, average errors on the right with a good range separated hybrid or with one of our composite methods. So in the roughly 20, 30 kcal or so. This is good enough for these, um, these processes. If you now test anything uh, that is available on a semi empirical level, PM6, one of our competitors, or GFN1 or GFN2, you see that you are on an order of magnitude worse. So errors are hundreds of KK. So PM6 with an average error of 400 is absolutely, absolutely useless. Next slide, please. So this is really difficult thermochemistry, but we also want to get um, something right, which is important in practice. And this is uh, the conformation energies that I already talked about. You see here some results for some subsets from this GMTKN55. So the target accuracy, that is room temperature, uh, is about a 0.5 kcal or so. And if you go through the sets here, you see from the left alkanes, amino acids, and then peptides and sugars and so on and so forth, you see you are mostly worse than this target accuracy for any methods that we have tested. So this is our GF series of GFN methods, but also the PM6 is, is, is worse normally. And now you can average over, over all these sets and this is given in the inset of that diagram. You see typical density functionals shown in blue normally get this right. So they are better than this 0.5 target accuracy, but uh, the GFN methods and also our competitors um, um, are worse. So we want to get closer to this 0.5 target accuracy also for conformational energies. Next slide, please. So what is now the reason for that? My conclusion from over many years is that these semi-empirical methods suffer from, from a bad atomic orbital basis set. They mostly apply fixed given minimal basis sets. So, and yeah, based on this insight, I worked uh, in the last two to three years on um, developing better basis sets. And this is what I'm going to show you in the next few minutes. Next slide, please. So I started my basis set development um, at a valence double zeta basis set level. So this is the basis set um, that is used for this omega B97 X3C. This is on the left. And uh, the key issue here, what I also what I learned is that it is absolutely important, not as usual, you to optimize the, the basis set just for the atoms but you have to optimize this basis set for the target systems and that are molecules. So these basis sets are molecular optimized, not only for atoms, but also for ions. So that it covers the, the, the whole chemistry, okay? So, and that was the starting point. We also developed a tight binding method with that basis set, but that turned out to be kind of dead end for various reasons, in particular because this basis set is too big and cannot be 
straightforward um, applied in a tight binding context. And then I'm, I, I went back and thought again about it. And I wanted to have really a minimal basis set. But with a minimal basis set, you lose basically the flexibility. From a double zeta to a minimal basis set, you you uh, lose the property that your AOs can expand depending on the on the situation in your molecule. So and now I came up or one year roughly one year ago I came up with a new idea to to you to, to um, develop um, an, a special basis set which is now adaptive, and this is what is the basis for this new GP three XTB method. It's a single zeta, a polarized single zeta valence basis set. This is where the name stands for, VSZP. And the Q stands for the adaptivity. So we make this basis set the, the ability to contract or expand dependent on the atomic charge of the atom in the molecule. So the radically new ingredient here is that any atom in a molecule gets its own basis set that is specially adapted for the situation of the atom in the molecule. What this basis set can do is breathing in a way. Okay, it can it can become the AO can become bigger or smaller depending on the effective atomic charge. And this is what the Q stands for. And in the next two or three minutes, I'm going to show you how this works. Next slide, please. Or not, so first not how it works, but how important it is. So what you see here in the two diagrams and at the top is the radial um, distribution function of the electronic density for the hydrogen atom on the left and the hydrogen anion on the right. So you know, that in a hydride, the, the effective charge of the nucleus is screened. So this, this radial dependence becomes more diffuse. The, the AO expands, as you can see on the with the dashed curve, which is a, a complete basis set um, estimate compared to the, to, to the hydrogen atom. So now if you compare this target dependence or so the dashed line with what you get with a minimal standard minimal basis set indicated here by mini S or STO6G, then you see the radial distribution is the same because a minimal basis set can't react to this change of the effective charge. So what you have to do now is to build in this dependency in your AO. So, and the proposal is the following. So we pre-compute the charge or the effective charge from some simple model and then change the AOs in that minimal base set, but not non-linearly. We are not changing the exponents. We are changing the contraction coefficients. So we make a linear change to keep everything computationally uh, simple. So and the, this dependency is not only um, the, the, the effective charge Q, but also the coordination number. So an, an atomic orbital in a molecule also contracts if, it, if you have more neighbors. So if you form chemical bonds, then an AO is also normally shrinking. So we make this, this effective nuclear or atomic charge is a combined thing. So it's the, the real charge and then the coordination number. Next slide, please. That shows a formula, how it's done. The top formula shows a normal um, contracted atomic orbital. So you have Gaussian primitive psi, and then you have contraction coefficients. And these depend now on an effective atomic charge Q for the atom A, I in that molecule. So, and the dependency is, um, so this um, is a linear thing. So that helps us to implement this and, and get efficient derivatives. And here in the, in the bottom small table, you see an example. 
So the first column shows um, for some for some example, it's the, the hydrogen atom, the P shell. You see three contacted primitives, big exponent, medium, and smaller one. Then in the second column, you see the normal contraction coefficient that is anyway has to be determined. This is basically the contribution of that primitive to that AO. And what is new now is the, is the third column. This is the dependency of that contraction coefficient on the effective charge. So you see that in the last row, uh, this most diffuse primitive function has a negative contribution. So if the charge is, uh, is becoming negative, then you increase the contribution of the outermost most diffuse function. So then with negative charge, this AO will effectively expand. And if the charge is positive, the weight of the other, the um, steeper Gaussian primitives will increase. So then it can contract. So in these coefficients, these the standard um, uh, variables and also the new ones are totally variationally optimized, optimized um, for a set of reference atoms and molecules and ions at a DFT level. And then you can basically use this new adaptive um, minimal basis set for anything you want. Next slide, please. And this is a, um, a diagram similar to what you have seen before. So this is the weighted total mean absolute deviation for the entire GMTKN55 basis set uh, database. So I optimize these basis sets for the whole periodic table. And we can now take any density functional. Our favorite one is this omega B97X D4 from the Martin et Gordon group. And then you can compare now various basis sets with that standard functional. You see how badly standard minimal basis sets perform. 46 and 30 is even worse than, um, than GFN2 XDB tight binding. Def Def2 SVP is a standard Arich double zeta basis set. And then you see also the numbers that you've seen before, how well our double zeta uh, basis set performs compared to a quadruple zeta. So now the question is how good is this Q um, uh, VS set P? Next slide, please. And you see it almost, or it, it beats basically the double zeta level. It's a huge improvement compared to uh, the minimal basis set. So basically it performs like a double zeta basis set, although it's only uh, a single zeta. So, and this of course is the, the definitely the best choice for, for any semi empirical method. Next slide, please. Yeah, we tested this also for various other uh, properties in particular basis set superposition error is much smaller as can be seen here. It's almost as good as our VDZP and much better than any, any existing standard basis sets. So this is all important for, for non-covalent interactions. Next slide, please. Yeah, also for, for these uh, conformations of, of the large peptides, this works pretty well. Next slide, please. So now we, we take these basis sets and in particular this new adaptive basis set for various purposes. I only want to show you the, the approach for the next level type binding indicated in, in the left down corner of this diagram. So the GP3 XTB now uses this basis set and some new contributions. So we want to, for this method, we want to improve the whole physical description here in that. So basically bring the semical um, theory development to some kind of end. Next slide, please. So what is new in that? So I should for, for maybe give you a, a, first a, a, an idea about this GFN family. So what we had previously. So this is a tight binding energy expression. So we took that from uh, uh, from previous work from Marcus Elsner, for example. Uh, so it's a, a general theory to approximate DFT, 
by the ta by a Taylor expansion in density fluctuations. Okay, you take <clears throat> a reference density of the neutral atoms, a superposition of neutral atoms for the molecule, and then you expand the energy change from that ensemble of atoms in density fluctuations. And this Taylor expansion can be truncated at various orders. And you can also then express these density fluctuations in at various levels. And the latest, our latest version is GFN2 XTB. It includes also multiple electrostatics and some third order terms. Next slide, please. I have no time to go through the um, terms that I used in detail. Next slide, please. I only want to summarize here what this um, GP3 does uh, better than, than the previous one. So first of all, it should be a method for general purpose. Not only geometries and frequencies, non covalent interactions. Basically, it should approach DFT, Quansham DFT for, for anything. So we have this DFT optimized adaptive basis set that I've shown you. And this is the, the underlying or the main new feature. And this is not changed here in, in the parametrization process. It's just taken from the variational DFT optimization. So then we have a set of new ingredients. And the, the other most important is that we are now approximating not a GGA as before, but a range separated hybrid. So we include non-local Fock exchange. This costs a bit more. So that adds some computational overhead, but we are approximating Fock exchange, so it's not so much. So the benefit here is that we repair self-interaction error mostly and also avoid uh, artificial charge transfer and also get now correct orbital energy gaps. So this is absolutely important for high accuracy. So then we have new terms in the H0 part of the Hamiltonian. We have a new electrostatic term, first order, that makes uh, ions much better. Our, our multipole expansion is improved compared to GFN2. We have now the full third order electrostatic at electrostatics. Then from the very beginning, we have a consistent unrestricted version for open shell systems. So you basically get the same symmetry broken SCF solution as a standard DFT. We have more consistent reference data, which are coupled cluster or mostly large basis set uh, range separated hybrid. Yeah, and then important in practice at the end of the day, it is a bit slower because the basis set is a bit a bit larger and also um, we have this range separated hybrid um, included, but it's not more than a factor of two to three. And it's still um, much, much faster than any existing DFT. So this is, in my opinion, the best um, similar for quantum chemistry, best physics than, than I can think of. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, next slide. This is too much for this talk about details of the new terms. Next slide, please. So I'm working now day and night on the, on the parameterization for the entire periodic table. This is a huge effort. So I'm still not finished. Um, I have some preliminary results, which are say 90% or so to the, to the final version. So I can show you already some preliminary results. So first, um, confirmation and energies. You have seen some of these subsets before. Uh, in gray is the standard PM6, hartree fock based simian pilkel theory. In blue, this is the previous GFN2, and in yellow, the new one. You see, can see here that almost for almost all of the confirmation energies, we are better than GFN2, sometimes much better. So there is really improvement. Next slide, please. This is here really the hard, the really the, the, the extreme test. I said it already, the mindless molecules. Uh, here you have these huge errors in the, with the standard methods. And you see that the yellow bar, the GP3 is relatively close, very close. Better than I've, uh, better that I've thought that it can be made so good. So it's around 30 or so MAD here for that set. Next slide, please. 
I have param parameters uh, already, not for all of the elements in the GMTKN, but for many of them, this is 95% or so. So the blue bar, that is a number that you have seen before. So about 25 to 30 or so is the deviation for GMTKN 55. Um, Omega B97 X3C is around five or so. And then you see some other three um, C methods that are around ten or so, and that was the, my 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 dream in the very be beginning. What I have mentioned, so achieving around ten for a tight binding theory, and I think we we have it. I'm I'm really happy about that. Of course, I have to finalize it. Um, I don't know if I can make it maybe even better than ten, but but it's roughly speaking, it's um, DFT accuracy achieved. Next slide, please. Yeah, I tested already in the in the in the face of benchmarking um, various um, sets that are normally not included in the fits. Here, this is from Jan Redsack, the NCI atlas. So this is uh, also unusual non-covalent interactions, also at short distances, more complicated systems than usual. So. IHB are intramolecular and ionic hydrogen bonds are difficult. Uh, sigma holes, uh, SH250, are difficult for standard GFN2 in blue. And you see also here that uh, new method performs pretty well. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is preliminary tests for barriers. Let me come to an end. I'm already too long. Next slide, please. So I want to summarize what I what I've shown you. Uh, so we have so the starting point of that basis set development was the VDZP basis set with an East standard ECP. We have that for the full periodic table with negligible super basis set superposition error. And the first step was to make a new 3C reference method out of that. So by simply adjusting the, the dispersion correction, um, you get a very accurate um, range separated hybrid that is um, already available in, in a bug fix, bug fix version of Orca or by some input switches. Um, the, the newest Orca release will, will just make it available by, by some keyword. Uh, a 3C method that is a bit faster uh, is also recommended, which is R2 scan 3C. This is based on uh, one of the latest John Perdue uh, meta GGAs, so with a standard uh, reduced triple zeta basis sets. So from that starting point, I developed and optimized a new adaptive minimal basis set that closely approaches uh, this VDZP quality. It's it's worse, it must be worse, of course, but it's close. And it's definitely sufficiently uh, accurate um, for, for any semi-empirical development. It's really a step forward regarding the basis set. So now I'm in the process of um, finalizing this new GP3, which should be a complete replacement of all the GFN methods that we have. It's a bit, they are a bit slower, but much more closely approaching DFT for general chemistry. We hope, I hope that I can finalize it in the next month or maybe at most in the, in the, up until summer or so. So, and my last remark here is that benchmarking, thermochemistry benchmarking is a very important part of it. And in particular, benchmarking on unusual and large systems that are normally not used. You really want to see, you really want to cross-check what you are doing and this that it, that it is robust. Huh? Successful methods that are used by many people uh, should be robust. And this is also one of our paradigms. Yeah, this is a lot of work. I cannot do it alone. Uh, I've three main co-workers in addition to my, my whole group. So first of all, Thomas Freudsheim is right now 
implementing part of the GPC. In particular, he is working on the analytical gradient, which is a, is a bit more complicated than usual. So Marcel Müller helped me a lot with the previous versions, the v, uh, DZP and also the Omega B97 X3C. And Andreas Hansen is doing a lot of the benchmarking. So this is the core team of, of the GP3. Yeah, that was my talk. I hope I um, it was interesting for you and I'm open for all, any any question. Thanks.